1056. <laughs> All right, that's okay. When you're having fun in Christ, that's okay. But you've got to give me an extra five minutes now, okay? All right. Now, the a reading for this morning is not the Lucan or Mithean reading. I think it was the Mithean reading. Uh, that changed along the way, um, and the bulletin, part of that bulletin was printed before the actual last uh, reading was given. But the reading is actually from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. I want to read it because it puts context to my message for this morning. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. I'm trying to figure how that really looks like. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under the heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound and the crowd seeing what they saw gathered and were bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? You know, those lowly Galileans, that's what they meant. And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia. Been there. Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered. And said, they are filled with new wine. Not cheap wine, but new wine. Now, I'm going to try to finish in five minutes my two-part series that I started with last Sunday. On that six-letter word, or four-letter word in some circles, the word, remember, was change. To suggest that the disciples gathered that Pentecost day for the number of days that were gathered, but this specific day were transformed by that experience would be the biggest understatement of the century. They were. If you take a fuller view of the text in the story, I'd love to go more into it, but we don't, we won't, not this time, on another occasion. If to take a fuller look of this, this story here, this narrative, you'll notice that, that after this experience, these men and women were never the same. Transformed by the power of that experience, by the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. The change that led to transformation. I, I want to suggest to all of us that change, the word change, really is an experience. It's gradual for some and it's boom all of a sudden for others. But it leads change, physical, environmental, personal, spiritual change, leads to transformation. And what these men and women experienced there was nothing less than Miraculous. As a result of that experience, they moved from timid, insecure, and awkward followers of Jesus of Nazareth to bold, unapologetic believers and troubadours of grace in Jesus Christ. 
that happened because of that experience. As a result of their, I call it Pentecostal experience, many of you may not know, but my earliest church roots are actually in the Pentecostal tradition. So I know a little bit about Pentecost and all that, that comes with that. It, again, again it, it, the point I want to make is that it moved them from timid and insecure and awkward believers in this Jesus who is no longer with them, who's disappeared from the face of the earth. And they're still, they're still wondering, you spent years with us, several years with us, and then you disappeared from us, you know, in the language of the ascension uh, a few weeks before that. And, and they become extraordinary believers in Jesus because of that experience. In fact, some of you may not know, and some of you may know, that, that Peter, the impetuous Peter, was never the same. He became as bold as you can be. This guy was standing in, in the street corner and given the opportunity, he preached the gospel anywhere. Now, I don't recommend you do that. Often when I see those kinds of folks, I bless them. But they don't do nothing to my soul. And sometimes they're problematic more than they are a blessing. But hey, you know, more power to you. This is America after all. But Peter became the emboldened Peter whose life was never the same. In the Roman Catholic tradition, as you know, Peter was the first pope. In the Roman Catholic tradition. Bartholomew, someone you probably... Yeah, you read his name, saw his name somewhere, but it was, it's mentioned somewhere in the Christian scriptures. Becomes according to tradition. After this experience, literally after several years, becomes, it's well known, a missionary to ancient Armenia and in Ethiopia and even the southern Arabian Peninsula. Thomas, the one who preaches beat up because he doubted Jesus' resurrection. Thomas became the number one proclaimer of the very earliest gospel message to India. In fact, there is presently today uh, in Kerala, the state of Kerala in India, uh, in a Christian denomination that is, is, is ancient, almost Roman Catholic and high church in its style of worship, and yet very probably they feel comfortable being here this morning. Those folks, those believers, by the way, there's a, there's a, there's a church, one of their churches, literally here in Orlando of all places, maybe because of Mickey Mouse, I don't know. They're here. The result of the emboldened man who believed, we believe, some believe, denied the very resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. These people experienced something unique. And I, I would encourage us to seek that in our own lives as well. Because that's the only way the congregations can stay focused and committed to the message of Jesus. Of making a difference in people's lives. Just like you're doing X times, 10x time, 20x time, 50x times, reaching more people for Christ and his love, just like all of you gathered here today. The only way we can as a congregation, as a church, as believers in Jesus, grow. Growing is important. It's not the only thing, but it is key to our common life together. The only way we can do that if we experience our own Pentecostal experience. How that looks like to you and me, it's going to differ. But let me offer, in cutting my sermon quite a bit, <laughs> some possibilities of how we can do that. The first one is is believing this church thing, this thing we call gathering together as a family of faith on Sunday morning, is about the God of all creation. It is not about you and me. No one person here is, is the center of the universe. 
God is the center of the universe. We've got some incredible people in this place. But I am sure none of them would consider themselves the center of Windermere Union Church. God in Christ is number one. Number two, believe that you and me together are instruments, God's instruments of transformation. It ain't going to happen, forgive my English, it ain't going to happen by some religious osmosis. It happens because of you and me touching someone, reminding them that they are loved. Third, believe that God has a multiplicity of ways of connecting through us the good news of Jesus Christ. There is a church in um, Wildwood, Florida, just up the street, um, near where I served my last interim. And I just discovered it online. It's, it's, it's a United Methodist Church. And, and I'm going to study them and share their model. And maybe have the pastor of that church join us in some Zoom training, training evening uh, for leaders. And all of us, all of us, but with an emphasis on leaders. For you to see the models that they're using to reach people that we would never reach. But we can. And we must. So to looking at models of how God engages through us in the world. And finally, acknowledge the limits of our capacities. I can only do so much. Todd can only do so much. Right, Todd? Kevin can only do so much. Alan can only do so much. Lord knows how much he's done. All of us are limited in our capacity. Could you imagine what that looks like when we do it together? When we do it in conjunto, in Spanish, in connection, and like a, like a band playing together, that beautiful piece, especially that last one. It was marvelous. But it didn't happen because all of a sudden, Troy and our musicians just decided they wanted to play without knowing how to play music. It took training and years of training and years of commitment. And maybe mama, you stick to that piano kid, you're gonna play till the <laughs> fingers hurt. Can you imagine what a church can do together what it envisions its limitations on the one hand but it sees its possibilities as an instrument of transformation in the world oh my gosh you've done it for 27 years now we've got to take it forward for another 27 years and our job in these next how many hundred a hundred and <laughs> 61, two days? I lost track, Alan. I'm losing track. Can you imagine what we could do together if we had our own Pentecostal experience like those first disciples did? And we decided to say, you know what? There's only one life to live. I'm going to live it fully in every sense of the word, but I'm going to give it to Christ and Christ alone. Can you imagine what that means in reaching peoples we'll never be able to reach if we don't take the first step? Acknowledging our limitations on the one hand and the limits of our capacity, but making sure we have a clear mission of where we're going in preparation for our settled leadership very soon.